BK Chukumerije joins us from our Abuja studio. Thank you, Mr. Chukumerije, for your time tonight. And thank you for creating time to talk about your open letter. Let's begin the conversation by getting some clarity on what capt you captured in your open letter, which has been circulated widely. And you, you have explained why you wrote it, other than your usual well-managed few lines in your poems. What propelled you to pen that open letter? Um, I was responding to certain things that Mr. President said uh, in an interview he gave last week, uh, particularly concerning uh, open grazing and the farmer header crisis and his attitude to it, as well as um, um, his attitude towards certain unrest, particularly in the southeastern part of the country. Uh, I was moved to write the letter because I am a concerned Nigerian and I feel that the country is uh, in a very difficult spell at the moment and that it's very important for people that truly care about Nigeria, that th truly love Nigeria, to really have their voices heard in the debate. Uh, it's beginning to feel like the debate is polarized between two extremes. And I felt it's important for uh, a voice in the middle to be projected, for perspectives that come from a, a pan-Nigerian perspective uh, to be projected into the public space. Uh, and that, that was what motivated me to, to write that letter. Okay, so f before we get so deep into the letter, the president addressed the nation. Let me get, uh, I guess you watched that uh, national broadcast and uh, it's being also reported widely uh, since yesterday. What's your view or your general assessment of the president's broadcast? Um, my general assessment is that the president might be a bit removed uh, from popular feelings uh, in society. Now, there's a bit of a dislocation or disarticulation between uh, what he thinks and how people are feeling generally in society. And that there is a need for the president to improve the effectiveness of his communication to Nigerian citizens at this point in time. There is a great need for more effective communication from the presidency. But uh, th does the broadcast in any way answer any of the questions you raised in your open letter? Um, uh, n n not really. Uh, none of those. The issues I raised in the letter, I feel, are still to be addressed. Okay, let, let, let's perhaps go deeper into your open letter now. And let me take uh, a portion of what you, uh, what you uh, wrote in the letter. Uh, permit me to read uh, in your uh, part of the open letter. And you said, and I quote, Attempting to force the country back to the days when a vast country and a relatively small and dispersed Population made open grazing sustainable is a futile uh, is as futile as banning Twitter. That train has left the station. Already under your watch, the historic Hausa Fulani cla classification has, for the first time in living memory, been broken. If you keep trying to send us back in time with a policy position that considers the root cause of Nigeria's most lethal crises, the headers farmer crises, as the inability of other ethnic groups to understand the Fulani, your only success will be for, uh, further isolating uh, the Fulani as targets. Uh, could you expatiate on what you meant by that? I was responding to uh, the president's comment on directing his government to go back to uh, certain things gazetted in the 1960s concerning grazing routes and grazing reserves for nomadic Fulani headsmen to encourage uh, open grazing as his uh, solution to the farmer header crisis. And I was trying to point out that uh, the realities of the 1960s are no longer the realities of today. 
that open grazing was sustainable in the 1960s because we lived in a different kind of country. Now, the country was vast. The population was not as much as we have today. Uh, you didn't have cities like uh, Abuja the way it is, so the country has grown. And it's no longer possible for you to uh, carry out open grazing in a sustainable manner. That open grazing today is leading to conflicts that are causing more deaths than any other conflict in Nigeria today, year on year. And, and this is very easy to verify. So that um, it's the, only, the only thing that can be achieved by really trying to force us back into the 1960s template is that there will be growing animosity against the Fulani as an ethnic group, you know, which really shouldn't be. You know, but people lash out in anger, and suddenly the Fulani has become a polarizing figure. And we never really had that in Nigerian history before. Before, the average southerner would refer to the Yausa Fulani as if they are one ethnic group. All of a sudden, today, you have people isolating the Fulani and, and identifying them or targeting them. And one of the root causes for this is the sense that uh, we have a president who, is, uh, who tilts a bit too much in his assessment of social e issues or panders a bit too much to the interests of the nomadic Fulani. I made the point that open grazing is a cultural practice. But culture is not static. It's dynamic. It has to evolve to keep up with times. And the times have changed. And that cultural practice can also change. It's possible. And in fact, uh, uh, the government, this present government, I mean, has its own, it has the National uh, Livestock Transformation uh, Plan, for instance, that recognizes this, that open grazing is a cultural practice that needs to change. So it was surprising to then hear the president speaking, and not even speaking in the spirit of the plan of his own government. So does it mean that the president has a different view while the government has a different, you know, there's that, that disarticulation I'm talking about. But open grazing is a cultural practice that needs to evolve with the times. Because now the social cost of open grazing is getting too much. From Zamfara to Bayelsa, people are dying on a daily basis. This is not something that should be condoned or allowed to carry on in that way. We have to find a way of encouraging nomadic Fulanese uh, to move from open grazing to more sedentary forms of livestock management. So that's the point I was, I was making in the letter. Okay, it does look like you touched on it because I was going to ask you, because you said in your letter, you, told, you were referring to the president, you said your solution to the farmer herder crisis is not the correct one. So I was going to ask, what then do you suppose is a solution? And I, and I mentioned that the government already has a plan, the, the National Economic Council, uh, from January 2019, uh, two years ago, they came together uh, and put together the National uh, Livestock Transformation Plan. It's a plan in the right direction because it comes out of a multi-stakeholder approach. So the, the federal government, the state government, farmers, herders, everybody sits around a table and dialogues and finds a way to make this thing happen that takes everybody's interests into consideration. So I think that that is a plan that can be built on. And in 10, 15 years, we can see a shift. It's never easy to change a cultural practice. It, it's not easy. But that is a plan that is moving in the right direction. And one would have expected to see the president, you know, bringing his moral authority as president to back a plan like that. You know, rather than beginning to suggest this sort of unilateral, everybody just understand the Fulani and accommodate the Fulani. It's a multicultural society. It's a diverse society. You have to balance the rights of one against the others. And if you find that, you know, the Fulani is the recurring decimal in conflicts across the country, in different et states, different ethnic groups, different religions, the, the recurring decimal is armed Fulani headsmen, armed Fulani headsmen in Zamfara, in Kaduna, in Benue, in Nasara, in Plateau, then it means that it falls on the Fulani to make the adjustment. You can't ask everybody else to adjust to accommodate one person. It's for that one person to adjust to accommodate everybody else. 
So there, there's, there is already a plan that has come out of this multi-stakeholder approach that needs to be backed and evolved rather than trying to sort of impose unilateral solutions on a society like ours. I feel that it will only lead to more conflict. Let me take another portion of your letter and uh, I'd like you to uh, answer to some of the issues you raised here, perhaps uh, clarify more. You said, and I quote, our founders and our current constitution recognize that one Nigeria is a construct that has to be proactively invested in and built if it is to be realized. And that one of the most important tools for doing this is running an inclusive government. That is a government that listens. That is a government that engages with different points of view. That is a government that carries everyone along. That is a government that, according to Sir Amado Bello, does not pretend that we do not have differences. And, of course, you made mention of the infamous 5% comment. Uh, let me get your view on this and perhaps what you've raised as an inclusive government. Could you perhaps give us a sense of what prompted your opinion on this very point? Do you have any specific example in mind? Yes, I, I mean, I was, first of all, uh, th that comment came, first of all, out of um, the fact that the president had uh, sort of said that we need to uh, understand, you know, the, the Fulani uh, particularly and have talked about his relatives from Niger and uh, other, you know, countries outside Nigeria. And I had asked the question, you know, where does, where does loyalty lie? Does it lie to the ethnic group or does it lie to the nation? And I had pointed out that for the average Nigerian, we all of us have this internal struggle because we all have ethnic groups and we're all citizens of this nation. And we all struggle with this sometimes, this sense of divided loyalty. You know, which one should I be more loyal to, my ethnic group or my nation? And because we have that dual sort of identity, I made the point that that's one of the reasons why a cardinal principle of the Nigerian state is to run an inclusive government that inclusiveness, our sense of belonging in the Nigerian nation, helps us all overcome our natural instinct towards tribalism. Because if we live in a state that is accommodating, if we live in a state that is just to all, then we are encouraged to offer our loyalty to that state. And I, and I, I made that point, and that is why uh, an inclusive government is a cardinal principle of the Nigerian state. And specific examples that have triggered this, um, I mean, this letter is six years down the road. But the comment the president made early on in his uh, government administration about the 95% and the 5%, that comment, I don't know whether there is a single comment that he has made throughout his presidency that has had a more damaging effect uh, on a sense of belonging, particularly for the southeastern Southeastern has a people from the southeastern region. It was not a comment that a president of, of a country like ours should ever have made, uh, because it, it gave the impression that the president uh, saw a certain part of the country as not uh, fully deserving of his full attention, his warmth, his love, and things like that. And that immediately begins to breed a sense of marginalization, alienation, and it's in that gap when people feel alienated from the state, that's where you start having the seeds of unrest and tension that we're seeing around the country. We have also seen a very, very visible lopsidedness in the president's appointments, particularly into key sensitive positions. And it is something that I feel that the Nigerian state traditionally, effort is always made to make the government and every aspect of the government as representative as possible for this reason to create a sense of belonging which is very critical in a diverse society so i also listened to the president's explanation particularly when he was talking about the appointments of the chief of army staff and i felt that his explanation was actually very rational and very correct that, listen, sometimes you have to make appointments solely on the basis of merit, and that he appointed the best man for the job 
in that situation. And I, I agree with them. Because he very clearly appointed a soldier as soldier, and somebody who has the heart and the trust and, and respect of, of soldiers. And anybody who follows my writings know that, knows that I'm a very committed believer in meritocracy. But I also live in a diverse society, and I know that the meritocratic principle has to be delicately balanced against the representative principle. Government needs to be representative, at the same time, government needs to be competent. And these two principles need to be balanced against each other. You cannot throw one away for the other. You must always take both into consideration if Nigeria is going to be a stable union. So if you look across the entire spectrum of the security architecture, you know, the army, the navy, the air force, the police, the uh, civil, uh, civil defense, the intelligence agencies, and you find that there is no representation at all from a part of the country. It is something that everybody should sit down and query because, for instance, now you have unrest in that part of the country and none of the architects of a security solution are from there. It's very important in the meetings where security solutions for the Southeast is being designed that there, there are people from there in, the, in those meetings to bring the local flavor into the design of solutions for that region. This is the reason why representation is important in diverse societies. So it's that inability of the president to balance the meritocratic principle against the, against the principle for representation. Let me make it clear that I agree that it is very important. And there are certain times and certain frontline uh, services like um, security, education, health. There are certain frontline ministries where really meritocracy should be the first consideration. But that principle just needs to be balanced. And I'm happy that the president himself made the argument for meritocracy because the argument is then available also tomorrow, you know, for a different president to also use to justify making certain appointments into areas he considers vital. So I have no problem with the meritocratic principle, but it simply needs to be balanced. That's what our constitution asks for, balanced against the need for the government to be representative. And I, I will hope that the president will take this into consideration. So you highlighted a lot of things. Since we're talking about Nigeria's democracy, this is a day after uh, June 12th, Nigeria's Democracy Day. And some of the issues that you raise, they've raised questions on the principles of democracy. And you're talking about President Buhari and some of the things you disagree with. And you're uh, raising your uh, views on some of those things you need to pay attention to. For example, we know that President Buhari spent most of his uh, youthful young uh, age as a military officer. And we understand that he's a military man by training. But he is said, and he was quoted to have said that he's a converted Democrat. With some of the things that you've raised in your open letter, do you have any reason to believe otherwise? Um, what I would say is that the president is a converted Democrat, but... Uh, may still be struggling with some of his military uh, tendencies. It's very, it's very hard to break uh, a lifelong habit. So we have a president that consistently complains about how uh, human rights and democratic processes hamper him, slow him down, prevent him from being able to do his job. So that is clearly someone that is not comfortable, uh, totally comfortable with uh, democratic processes that feels that they are a hindrance. There's that sense that they are a hindrance. So sometimes he seems to come across as, listen, I need to have totalitarian or authoritarian powers in order to fix Nigeria, which is sort of the military mentality that Nigerians are hard-headed people. You have to use iron hand over them. You know, but in truth, you cannot whip or frog jump a country into development. You cannot do that. And modern concepts of development are centered around the concept of human rights. 
an expanded concept of human rights, not just fundamental human rights, but also economic rights, rights to health, rights to education, rights to a, to a good job. Uh, this is what development means to facilitate access to these rights for your citizens. So denying rights in any way cannot facilitate development. It can only precipitate uh, tensions and conflicts and insecurity. So we need the government to, or the president to really become a believer in the importance of human rights, giving, allowing Nigerians to have full access to the full range of human rights is the object of development. It is not, uh, it, is, it is a contradiction in terms to say that you can develop a country or in order to develop a country, you must first deny or in any way infringe on the rights of a citizen. You know, development is freedom, according to Amartya Sen, the Nobel laureate in economics. Development is the freedom of the individual to own and exercise his individual rights. All right. So the government so, should not interfere with that. The government should rather be enhancing our capacity to enjoy our rights. Perhaps on the final note, so we can wrap up this conversation around your open letter and some of the issues that you have raised. And you raised a point around the agitations in the land and the reason or the cause for the agitations and some of the violence and disagreement that we have seen in the country. And you also mentioned that part of it is uh, the consideration for an inclusivity uh, by the President Buhari administration. But do you suppose that heading into 2023 election, would you suppose that uh, zoning the presidency to the east or to the southeast will be an answer to such a dilemma? It will contribute. It may not be the final and total answer, but it's a step in, the di in that direction. Uh, like I said, by inclination and ideological belief, I am a meritocrat, but I, also, I am also pragmatic that I understand the society I live in and the times that I live in. I believe that this is a time for us as a country to make concessions for the sake of peace. Yeah, there has to be peace first. My people say, Ndubisi, you know, that we have to be alive first before anything else can happen. You know, so for the sake of peace, I feel certain concessions should be made. Uh, zoning is something that I find uncomfortable. It sits, I, it sits uncomfortable with me as an individual. But I have come to recognize the wisdom of our founding fathers in insisting on things like federal character, insisting on things like representation, because of the nature of our society and the strength of our ethnic identities. So it is important to have that open and frank discussion about access to power and competition for power. If open competition for power is always going to lead to conflict, then let's just make it formal. All that right. Power will be rotated from north to south. Mm -hmm. Instead of having this gentleman's agreement, let's just sit down, formalize it. It will stay in the north for eight years. It will come to the south for eight years so that we can remove that element of conflict. Because really the important thing is not who is in power, but for us to develop institutions that ensure that whoever is in power is not able to, if they decide to begin to do bad policies and bad government, that there are enough institutional checks to prevent them from right. damaging society, just like we saw in America. Mm. So we need strong institutions. All right. you know, but I believe that an Igbo presidency may help you know, go a long way to contributing to Dow's intentions at the moment. Thank you so much tonight, DK, uh, for your thoughts and uh, sharing a larger uh, view of your open letter with us tonight on Channels Television. Ch uh, DK Chukumerije, a Nigerian poet, thank you indeed for your time. Thank you for having me.